as the now 99 in Dwell magazine and 50 under 50 innovators of the 21st century. Um, uh, Mitcha Joachim co-authored four books. Uh, one of them is Design with Life, uh, Biotech, Architecture and Resilient Cities. So this is very much along the lines of what, what we are trying to, uh, to work on. Uh, XSL, uh, XS, New Directions in Ecological Design, Supercells, Building with Biology and Global Design uh, Elsewhere Envisioned. Um, his work has been exhibited at MoMA and the Venice Biennale. And uh, Professor Joachim earned a PhD at uh, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, MAUD, Harvard uh, University, and an MArch from uh, Columbia. The uh, talk title is um, The Work of Architecture in the Age of Synthetic uh, Biology. Um, and I would like to um, give the stage to, to uh, Professor Mitchell uh, Joachim to, um, uh, to, to let us sort of uh, learn about what you've been doing over the past years. So Great. thank you very much. And the stage is yours. I'm going to mute my microphone uh, and then we see what, what comes. Thank you. Mitch. Super. Uh, thank you for that very warm introduction. Uh, I am really excited to be here and have a discussion with you guys. I actually look forward to the discussion part. So when it comes to the question answer moment, please speak up. I prefer uh, students or some faculty uh, to not be reticent or taciturn, but to actually contribute to the conversation. I enjoy criticism, so bring it on. Or comments, totally welcome. Uh, and and I, you know, I probably have heard it before, so I'm okay to hear it again, but you never know. I usually get some insight from outside that I think is really valuable. So uh, I, I'm gonna start sharing the screen and be showing you what we've been up to uh, for some time. Uh, and now I'm asking, does that look okay? Can everyone see that? Is that all right? Okay, good. So we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. So we're not your regular everyday architecture office. We're just not. We are a team of people uh, that work together collaboratively. It's most of, most things that I do is more of a referee. So with the design team and, and our research, uh, I ask the same amount of questions everyone else does, and we work towards getting to a much better project. That is kind of the goal. Uh, this is our single overriding predicate that we work under as our objective. And that is a uh, wildlife population is 50% less than it was in the 70s. That means we're killing everything. That's when I mean we, I mean folks in architecture, urban design, real estate, planning, uh, any kind of development. We are destroying habitat. And that comes down to every nine minutes, another species goes extinct. So you're responsible. I'm responsible and many other people, and we could do something about it. And I think that that's the goal that Terraform works under. This is the white rhino. And this guy is, um, well, it's not a guy, it's a, it's a female. There's only two left on the planet Earth. My daughters, uh, who actually live in Constance in Germany, uh, they will never see white rhinos again. They are, they are effectively extinct. So uh, if every nine minutes we lose another species, every bird, insect, mammal on this planet, we can expect more of this event happening. It's just unacceptable. Uh, I believe there's one that's been restored from a frozen zoo in San Diego, but uh, we, we can't let this happen. Uh, what we do today is in the field, uh, especially in architecture and in development, we have these paint by the number systems to do good. And essentially what you're looking at is uh, an amalgamation of everything from active house to well, to lead, Energy Star, B-Ream, all these systems from Asia to uh, the uh, United States and Europe that give you points for making a building green. Well, less than 5% of those points goes towards biodiversity. Let me say that again. Less than 5% of all the possible points goes towards the context that the buildings are in. And that is just not acceptable. Some of these systems are slightly changing, but we've got to do better. 
So our work is basically predicated on the idea of design against extinction. That's kind of uh, where we're at and what we think about when we do these projects. And that really helps us uh, understand our kind of mission and the task, if not the wicked problems before us. So one of the major issues is that there's so many of us. So we can expect something around uh, somewhere around 11 billion humans by the end of the century. That is an enormous amount of people. How are we going to live? What are we going to eat? How, what is our, how will our lifestyles change? How do architects play a role? And I think this is uh, crucial. Uh, issues such as the amount of meat production is expected to double by mid-century. Can we do something about it? Yes, we can. Uh, what about all of the things that fill up our streets? There's more vehicles than ever before, from scooters to odd one-wheeled Segway motorcycle things to trackless trains. Uh, architects can also be a part of understanding the general physics of this problem and reorient our cities so that they become manageable. This type of design uh, is often referred to as sustainability. I don't, I don't like that term. I know, uh, you know, having being a German resident myself, I, I understand that uh, you know the translation of the term it works, but it doesn't work in English. Uh, we like to use the term socio-ecological design which recognizes that we can author the engineering and the design part of things. We can absolutely control through biotech and engineered living materials, what we want to do in a design, but we have to recognize the social side, which is regulations, policy, the leadership class, and the capricious public that runs systems. So we think design must be holistic and inclusive as possible. So this first project, was a way of communicating extinction uh, to um, local populations. And here we, just, we came up with a simple idea, an egg, and inside it was an extinct species. And the thought was within seven years, this egg would slowly melt or decay over time. This was done for the United Nations uh, countdown with Ted, and that this egg made up of uh, different paraffin waxes and seeded with, uh, uh, different pollinators and other planting types, also made of mycelium, that it would be uh, subjected to the weather. And as it rots away, inside it is uh, a series of seed bombs and habitat elements and uh, flora that support a rare species at the edge of extinction. In this case, it's uh, like a salamander locally that only has fertilized eggs remaining. Those are kept cryogenically frozen and they are released after the egg system slowly decays. And then the, the uh, attendant comes, a technician, and release the species into the environment. But this is mostly done to explain to the public that uh, you know, what are these eggs, to ask those questions, to learn about the um, severe amount of extinction in the wildlife kingdom that we face every nine minutes, and that we need to do something about it. So these are very large structures, they're about uh, three to four meters in height, and they're deployed, this one was deployed um, here in Brooklyn, so that people can see what's happening with the local species in that area. Uh, another project very similar to that is very much about food. So this is called the urban farm pod or plug-in ecology. And here we use a rotegrity sphere to create the base flat pack geometry. So computation design is, is certainly a part of it to make these sphere systems that are meant to produce food in an urban environment. So here we have them anywhere from four feet in diameter to 17 feet. They're different than a wall, they're a ball. So they're three times the amount of surface area as a green ball versus a green wall. Uh, there is a, a, a 64 uh, double skin pots with wick irrigation that go into the, that are fed through um, these columns of drip irrigation feeders on the top that go down to a cistern at the base and recycle the water within the entire pod. We have these pleated or folded elements that cover up the, uh, the in-between spaces between the pots and the structure. And you could place anything you want to grow inside there locally. So this is something like spirulina, uh, wheatgrass, uh, arugula, mint, things that are high yield crops that you wanna have fast, fresh, and local. 
not corn, not wheat. You wouldn't use that for this purpose. It's stuff that you want to have on your salad and has a certain sense of connection and immediacy as you go from pasture to plate with your food. Uh, the inside is pink, not because uh, pink is a cool color, because it is. Uh, it's just that it's we have a lot of grow lights and grow systems in there. So a uh, typical camera can't pick up the UV radiation, the UV light for the plants. This is another view of it. The thing is uh, on a series of casters that can spin to get the most amount of solar income and you grow your food on this 360 degree sphere. Ikea has a version of it. They stole it from us. The Ikea version I think is called the garden pod. It is absolutely miserable looking, but the function is the same and it's super cheap and falls apart. Not surprised. And one other thing we've been working on was uh, creating an architecture office that had a biology lab, a fully functional BSL-1 laboratory. So this is an old photo of our first wet lab that we produced. So instead of buying a fancy 3D printer, uh, you know, we put together a lab on Craigslist. And also uh, through other forms of social media, we built our own PCR machine. We built our own laminar flow hood. We got incubators for really cheap. I got a pickup truck and drove to New Jersey to get our incubators from a, uh, a, a medical office and we had a fully functional lab. The concept here was, you know, our, one of our teammates at Terraform, Dr. Oliver Medvedic, he's now a professor at the Kembar Center for Bioengineering at Cooper Union. Uh, Oliver was my roommate at Harvard and we had this dream of combining biology and architecture. And to do that, we had to make a lab so that we could do bio work, uh, bio-based work alongside architectural work. And it was quite fun. And now it's become GenSpace and another group called Biotech Without Borders. And they're still around to this day. So this has been now almost 12 years of doing this kind of work. Here is an earlier project that came out of that lab. But it's a combination of 3D printing and then uh, bioprinting. Everything that we want to do is in that syringe, which is super hygienic. All the cells are located in there and they get printed onto uh, sanitary plates. So this bioprinter will help print cells into a certain geometry. It's not very effective, but was the first of its kind. And we were publishing variants of that one. The one we did use was a modified inkjet printer, uh, which does this kind of work with a thermo reversible gel and uh, extracellular matrix from pigs that get folded up on PGA scaffolding, but we're able to print a geometry from an immortal cell line to make something like this. This is, what we, this is not our work. This was done at Harvard, uh, and this is where Oliver had studied. Uh, but this is to make bladders for patients who have cancer. It's a simple organ, has no immunological system, no skeletal system. It's just a bladder made from cells, pig cells that get put into your body. We thought, can you use the same technology to make leather handbags, to make leather belts, leather shoes, where no sentient creature is harmed? It's a victimless uh, project. Eduardo Keck and uh, Oren Katz are other sort of bio artists that have done similar work. We imported this into industrial design and architecture. It's now a company called Modern Meadows that prints leather, leather for clothing. Uh, this was one of our early provocational provocations. So there's a project meant to get people angry uh, or at least interested about architecture and printing meat. So the concept here is uh, based on a typical stud construction system you find in suburbia, but here it would be what we call meat tectonics with fatty cells being insulation, sphincter muscles for doors and windows, cilia to deal with wind loads, and all of this printed into large uh, sheets that get folded up in, into place. It's not meant to stay alive. You essentially fill it up with sulfates and nitrates, curate it into a form of beef jerky like leather, and you have a home that is made from printed cells. Uh, we, you know, we've had a lot of fun with this. We've heard a lot of people make their comments and that's great. Uh, since then though, it has led to very serious endeavors in the field that have been promoting just this kind of work. When we did the first print, it was $3,000 for a centimeter of this material as how difficult it is to get the cells and then to print them into a shape. So, it, was not easy to do. Now that has gone drastically down in cost 
everything from other projects like the $300,000 hamburger to, again, Modern Meadows being able to do this in T-shirts, combined printed meat cells. This is called the in vitro meat habitat along with cotton. And we, we had a show in Prague. We put the meat house in front of the cathedral because we could. And this is uh, uh, where we work. So I'm here in the Brooklyn Navy Yards. That white building is a part of uh, the new lab in Terraform One. We have the densest amount of creative class people on the planet. So uh, the most amount of artists and rogue engineers and builders and makers actually are in Brooklyn, New York. And there's not too many spaces where they can build and make things. So we got a grant from Governor Cuomo to take over this military industrial complex and turn it into a cathedral for design and making, which is the space that we're in now. This is the original plans for having uh, shared workspaces and then shared tools, water jet cutters, robotic mills, uh, material libraries, micro assembly places, uh, areas for sewing and textiles or for electronic workbenching, uh, resin, casting, et cetera, all underneath one shared space. This is it today. Uh, there at the height before the pandemic, we had over 80 companies in here doing waste, food, water, energy, air quality, all kinds of work. A lot of mobility companies are here. Terraform is the only nonprofit and really one of the only architects even here. And we kind of jump in with other designers and in some moments, like we're working with a farm group and work on projects together. Our lab is similar to a science garage, more or less, although nowadays it seems to be everyone's working remotely and not remotely. But the idea of the space is to grow anything from mushrooms, lots of them, to uh, tinkering with small insects, to whatever uh, we're studying. So we, we actually uh, enjoy a space like that. It's not like, um, I don't know, Foster's office, which seems to be a slave ship with rows and rows and rows of people doing AutoCAD. Uh, we, we were as opposite of that as one could be, including not really using AutoCAD. So this is how we move, how we eat, and how we live in some of the projects that we've been working on. This one is called the Hug and Kiss Lamb Car. And the thought was to make vehicles fit cities. Uh, it doesn't move faster than 30 miles an hour. 30 miles an hour is the speed in Shanghai, Paris, and New York. Uh, it moves in a flock or herd of cars. It's designed to be scuffable, to rub up against other cars, to bounce into them, to bump. That's kind of the point. It's a very organic form of gentle congestion. And then you, you don't even drive. You're just there reading your book. And if you do hit another car, you just say chow and you go on your way. The entire vehicle is inside the wheel, drivetrain, suspension, motoring, all of that's happening in the wheel. The rest of it is made of super soft pneumatic materials air bladders and ETFE foil quilts, et cetera. And the car that we eventually productized was this one. You may have seen it. This one came out of uh, our research at MIT. It's called the Heroku. It's a car designed to fit a city, not the entire 20th century, which is trying to negotiate around cars. This car is a piece of technology to fit into cities. And if you think about it, most of the time, cars are not moving. So this vehicle is uh, designed to stand up and park all the time for storage. So you can fit about three or four of them in the same space you put in a Porsche SUV. Not that I, well, nothing wrong with Porsche SUVs, but these are cars that are miniaturized and move uh, together in a kind of a logic that's, that's what, uh, that, that makes sense through algorithms and optimizing the population and where they need to go in certain times. So this vehicle, not only does it stand up, and reduce its footprint, the chassis is deployable. So as it stands up, it gets smaller. But if you look at the wheels, which look very strange, the car spins on a dime, it's omnidirectional. Also the ingress and egress points, there's a, uh, the door is in front of the vehicle. It's the same as the windshield. So you get off directly into the sidewalk. You don't get off into the street where you can be hurt. And then we put all of these ideas about mobility into near visions of a kind of a biological future for our cities. So this is a, a, a socio-ecological design thinking of 42nd Street, where we have a riparian corridor through the center of our street, accepting all kinds of aqueous life. We have vertical farms and um, uh, uh, 
gardens on the facades of our buildings. We've got wind turbines, photovoltaics, all of them to contribute to energy. And the rest of the space is this kind of grand civic space to allow pedestrians to take over and be a part of the streetscape. There's some idea those robots are there for automation to take care of these, some of these systems. And then we have trackless uh, trains that deal with high throughput transportation. But mostly this is a space for pedestrians to enjoy. The best way to discover a city is walking. And I happen to love it. So we want to make walkability important, but we also want to do it so it's as green as possible. And this project was looking at uh, um, another material in cities. Uh, this was all well, population issues in cities, but this material was transgenic, uh, genetically modified transgenic E. coli. So we modified it to, to express uh, genes commonly found in jellyfish, a certain type of protein. Uh, we expressed two forms of coloration, a, a red and a blue. And that red and blue would show us the difference in urban population counts mapped into live E. coli colonies. So we compared humans with E. coli and we compare the growth rate of humans in cities using colonies of E. coli and the dilution method in our laboratory. So we had to learn how to draw with E. coli, not easy to do, uh, but a lot of fun. The different colors were used from existing populations to expanding populations. We then had, uh, we used alluvial gel, alluvium gel, sorry, in Petri dishes to grow the E. coli on top of these uh, uh, scaffoldings. Well, they weren't really scaffoldings, they were stencils produced from our CAD files from uh, geographical boundaries of existing city conditions to expanding ones. And then we showed the growth of the 50 densest cities on the planet Earth as one mega city growing with expanding population to reach 11 billion humans. So it was really a, a, what we call the bio city map. It was trying to explain to people like how enormous the impact will be as we increase our human populations. And here we did it with a miniaturized version uh, in the form of E. coli. We had USB microscopes at 500 times magnification that zoomed in on the transgenic E. coli to show those colonies at, at scale. Well, a little bit closer on the cellular level. On the other side of the map was a, a parametric informatic grid that shows different spike points of population growth. Most of the future population in this world will be in Asia. So that's what you're seeing there. And then the dark black zones is where we're expecting cities to shrink. We're seeing diminished population in those areas. That's many parts of Europe and even North America. So uh, we were able to use E. coli as a kind of analog computer to project the growth of human populations in cities. Here is another piece of urban metabolism we studied. In this case, it's waste. So this is inorganic and organic matter uh, to the tune of 36,000 tons of trash per day in New York City. That is one Statue of Liberty per hour in New York. If I was an alien, I would think that cities were invented to make waste. It's an enormous amount of waste. Sometimes it's five to six pounds of garbage can be produced by a single individual per day in New York. So that is insane. Uh, we have some of these maquettes or, or models that show this kind of missing Statue of Liberty and communicate to people about waste in cities. Uh, and then what can we do with it? Well, where can we be more proactive? How can we solve this problem? Well, this is one of the worst forms of waste, it's styrofoam. And here we use this creature, uh, a mealworm, to digest styrofoam. Mealworms actually eat styrofoam. You sprinkle a little oats and they're gonna go at it. They're not very fast, but considering it takes 500 to 1,000 years for styrofoam to return to the earth, I think if we wait a few weeks for mealworms to eat it, we'll be okay. The mealworms digest the styrofoam, they turn into frass. That frass can then, basically, it gets turned into garden mulch. There is no chemicals or VOCs after the, the mealworms eat the styrofoam. The mealworms themselves turn into darkling beetles and get eaten by birds or other insects. So they're very much a part of the food chain. The concept here is to have the public dump their e-waste, their styrofoam e-waste, that's things that come from brand new stereos, refrigerators, microwaves, a new computer, you get all this styrofoam, 
You don't know how to recycle it or upcycle it, but now you can throw it into a digester and watch mealworms eat it up. It's kind of fun, actually. They're a bit slow, but you, uh, over time, like I said, it's all gone. You put it into the garden. So we made these uh, a proposal for a public display of mealworm digestion of, of e-waste, and we then went ahead and built it. So this is a proposal for a massive farm of hundreds of thousands of mealworms, basically in recycling bins, and then a digester in the front that you donate your styrofoam to, watch the mealworms eat it, and then throw it into the garden. Above it is something we call a decomposition clock. It actually has a material signature of different types of, of uh, available materials that are commonly thrown out and how long it takes for them to decay. So something like polystyrene, 500 to 1,000 years. Then there's aluminum, which you probably would never want to throw out, different types of plastics and other waste materials. So the public becomes aware that you just can't throw waste away. In fact, there is no such thing as a way. It's, it stays forever. Eventually goes to the oceans and comes back into your bodies in some other form. So here you can see the mealworms are in the base of this hypercube system. And then the farm elements are everything to the left where we're growing more and more mealworms, that, ones that aren't digesting the styrofoam in that system. Here's showing some of the farms uh, in detail. Behind them are all the mealworms. That is the clock component on the top that's, uh, that's filled with mycelium to show also different materials decaying. This was located in Camden, New Jersey, which has got a severe problem of illegal dumping in that city. So we want folks to stop doing that. This is the Oculus on the roof of the project. So solar income pours down, light rains down on this project to the inside where it fills the space with the styrofoam and the mealworms inside that project. On the back, there's a number of bins that are devoted to growing weeds and grasses to help jumpstart those sites again and increase biodiversity in that particular area. And that's another view of it on site. And that's a view showing the mealworms eating the styrofoam and munching away. We help them, we help them along a bit with a little bit of oat bran. So that gets there. I don't know, their, their fluids going, and then they immediately start eating the styrofoam waste. And then uh, while we're on the topic of uh, different materials that one could make as architects with biology, this was a novel biopolymer we created out of acetobacter, which is essentially a bacteria expressed cellulose that you can get from kombucha tea and combined it with mycelium, that's the root base of a mushroom, dendritic roots of a mushroom, in this case, it was reishi. We combine those two to make a novel biopolymer. The thought was, what can you do with it? Sometimes you design with biology and you don't know, you know where can you place this material. So our thoughts were, let's grow some chairs. And we did. So this is the entire history of chair design in one slide. So you can check that box off if you, you haven't studied uh, furniture design yet. But here we've got 19th century and before, which is bespoke handmade custom crafted artifacts that there's a relationship between the maker and the chair itself in the 20th century. Thank you, Bauhaus, uh, Walter Gropius and friends. These are unitized volumes made from plastics and steel. Uh, I love mid-century furniture. This one, Charles and Raheem's. Uh, but the 21st century is furniture that you can grow. So uh, I can be as succinct as possible. We can grow furniture in a lab. Let's do it. So here is uh, one of my daughters, uh, she's in Germany, uh, and she's in kindergarten in a chair that we grew. So daddy grew a chair and she told her friends that not only did daddy grow the chair, but you can eat it. And I think that was exciting to the kids. It doesn't taste good, neither does glue or your crayons, but it's a chair in kindergarten that is grown in a biology lab. In this case, this one we made took 21 different PET molds to make this one to the geometry it was made in. And this was done now like, I don't know, it's like 12 years ago. We've learned a lot since, but we were one of the first groups ever working with mycelium. Phil Ross and Ecovative were friends of ours, and we have been perfecting it ever since. We've since moved on to making large scale chairs for adults made from plyboo in a triply curved parametric structure. 
that then is filled with agricultural waste, cotton husk. It's then acculturated with reishi. The reishi grows and dendritically replaces the cotton husks, and you get this beautiful triply curved surface made out of essentially the mushroom material. It takes seven days to grow. We apply heat roughly at 140 degrees and it petrifies. And here is a chair that's quite beautiful, triply curved, architecturally designed chair or engineered. Uh, we call this an engineered living material that when you're done with this chair, you throw it into a garden and it feeds thousands of other forms of life. It's completely compostable. Uh, and then just a, a, a few more projects uh, and uh, then I'll get some Q&A going, but I'm, I'm on time, surprisingly enough. Uh, this is a, a, a project we've been working on for a very long time. It's pleaching or grafting uh, woody plant matter together to form singular vascular systems. This is not new. Living elements in architecture or engineered living materials, ELMs, is the new hot thing to research in architecture. Uh, previous versions have been this sort of uh, a willow construction done. There's one in the Netherlands, another one in Italy, or this project on the other side, the BIC building or the BIQ building by Ove Arup. Here has uh, biomass or algae in the facade systems, but using living materials inside your building, we think is the future, especially for your generation. It's just I, building with concrete and steel uh, doesn't make sense anymore especially when we, we consider issues of sustainability. So our earlier proposal was this one, making homes where there's no distinction between the landscape and the dwelling itself. So it's made of grafted woody plant matter. And then how do you produce uh, this at scale? So here we have these bioreactors that grow ficus, the tap roots, into one long three meter root. We basically tease nature. So we uh, look at the hormonal signature of the tap root. We give it nothing but darkness and moisture, but no soil, which causes it to grow longer and longer and longer. And then when we get it as this big wet noodle, we pull it out, we put it on a scaffolding that's been computer milled, and then we tap it into soil, and then it lignifies, gets bark, and creates leaf propagation. So we have been doing all different kinds of studies with different lighting conditions, grow light conditions, uh, different pleated surfaces for grow chambers at different scales and different forms of ultrasonic misting to moisten the root structures. So they grow longer and at higher rates, but you basically get a root that you and then you eventually will turn into a plant and it's graftable and becomes an architecture. So it's sort of, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, wet, wet plant architecture. Here we are experimenting with different types in different uh, growth chambers, uh, different lighting scenarios, and you know, constantly shifting and reworking this model. So, uh, and eventually, you know, we, we got to systems that uh, were pretty well optimized, more or less coming from the Israelis because they're great with hydroponics. So we have a black box hydroponic system that grows roots that can turn into architecture. That's what you're seeing here is this ficus growing at, at high throughput rates. Uh, we then moved over to something else. Curiously enough, in Germany, we saw that there are these large scale biomass farms that grow willows to very large uh, um, sizes. And we thought, why not combine the building uh, or the construction building industry alongside a great agricultural and energy industry. So we take biomass energy production and move it into construction, as opposed to taking these willows and burning them, they get pelletized and burned to create fuel. Instead, we're taking them and using, using those same willows to build buildings where on day one, these engineered living materials are alive and it, are grown at full length. So we don't have to spend all this energy trying to make reactors to grow them. We just harvest them from a farm. So here they are, clusters of these willows fitted into a CNC scaffolding. So that controls the geometry. And those willows shape themselves over a triply curved space and create a home. Uh, we're premiering this one in the Vienna Biennale. We're really excited. It's called Home Alive where you have a home made of clusters of living willows that are grafted and placed on scaffoldings. 
and on day one are basically fully mature and can continue to grow for hundreds of years. We attach them to old growth trees to help with lateral loading. Here there's some ideas of algae systems in the window. This one's placed on a horse farm in upstate New York near Storm King uh, Sculpture Garden. The thought is we'd have a suburban home that's made of living elements that does its best to fit into the landscape and connect to old growth trees and all kinds of flora in the area. And then we have some horses there for scale. So this is, in our opinion, uh, a living architecture. And uh, the last two projects uh, are about bugs. So this is crickets. And this was our client for some time. And the thought was, uh, can we help the United Nations deal with this uh, issue of eating too many cows, pigs, chicken, and lamb? The United Nations was talking about getting to insect-based protein. And if you do the numbers on that, it's roughly 2,000 gallons of water is saved when you eat flour produced from crickets versus protein from a cow. Uh, it's the same amino acid structure. It's actually a great source of protein. I do not want to eat an actual bug, even though 80% of the planet eats bugs, and, you know, but Europe and America does not. You also save 300 times the amount of greenhouse gas emissions if you eat uh, protein, alternate forms of protein from insects as opposed to uh, cows or pigs or chicken. So this was a comparative analysis of two 100 acres of land one is in an urban area where we're producing cricket flour, and the other one is open land for cattle production. You can see you get the same amount of protein, but you save enormously on water and greenhouse gas emissions, including even carbon delivering the materials to the site. So you actually don't, you go directly from pasture to plate if you grow your food, your meat inside cities. So here we are working on uh, different elements to create spaces for the crickets. This project is called the Cricket Shelter and Farm. There's 320 of these bio units that allow the crickets to live for about two months and they die naturally. So we're not stabbing crickets individually and killing them and then stuffing our faces with them. We're doing just the opposite. We provide them a great space to live. They're completely comfortable. They live out their lives naturally and eventually die of old age. They're usually well-fed. We feed them apple cores, lime rinds, orange peels, and that actually changes the flavor of the cricket. So it's good for us. We've been working with Michelin-rated chefs, another guy named Joseph Yoon and Brooklyn Bugs, et cetera, to get the flavor of the cricket flower just right. Uh, they live inside these um, chambers, and the bigger and fatter they are, uh, the less they move around until eventually they just die of old age, and then we harvest them uh, uh, like you would anything else, and they're milled into a flour. Uh, the best pasta I've ever had was actually from cricket flour. So this is uh, the device. You can see the inside of it, the dialog gates. It's actually expandable. So you can, depending on the, the size of the empty lot or rooftop or wherever you want to grow your crickets, it certainly can expand to do that. It's naturally ventilated. So that's what these things are on the top, are wind cowls that help generate high pressure uh, air throughout the system that causes vibrating columns of air lower on to ventilate the whole uh, shelter and also picks up the sound of the crickets chirping. So they do straddulation, which is they move their uh, wings back and forth, which means the males are horny looking for females. It means they're not worried about uh, survival, but they actually want to have babies. And the, the horns on the top uh, pick up that sound and the chirping can be heard from far away. It means that the shelter is singing, the shelter is alive and the creatures inside it are very satisfied. Here we have these cricket sex pods, which is encouraging the males and the females to get together in closed confined spaces so they can procreate and spread their genetics throughout the farm and keep the cycle of life uh, going. That is the, the cricket shelter and farm uh, over here in this particular image. And then finally, the, the last project is called the Monarch Sanctuary. And this was looking at a species native to North America, especially New York. It's one of the most beautiful butterflies you can ever see. Although honestly, all butterflies are great. Uh, we actually were working on the American Museum of Natural History, the exhibit for butterflies here in New York. 
but I've also been to Incel Minow, uh, which is one of the nicest butterfly uh, uh, terrariums in all of Germany. Uh, it's in the Lake of Constance. Uh, but we wanted to preserve specifically this species that's threatened. So they're in danger. We lost 90 million monarchs and they might disappear. So our thought was, can we build a building that is fully functional for human use, but in the interstitial spaces, we think of the life cycle of the monarch butterfly from its egg laying stage to caterpillar, to chrysili, to its relationship with milkweed, to adult butterflies, all of these systems fitting inside the facade, double skin facade of the building, and accounting for the amount of light, uh, the appropriate uh, oxygen levels, and also all the nectar and food that they need, and build a sanctuary for these butterflies. We call it a, uh, a vertical uh, mosaic biotope. So it's essentially a, a mosaic landscape that skins the surface of the building, goes up to a pollinator garden on the top, and all of this is a porous membrane for the butterflies to come in and out of the space. So the butterflies became our client. We had to learn what it takes for them to drink, to eat, to procreate, where they rest, things like mud baths and perch points and fruits that they enjoy. We put LED, OLED screens on the outside of the building so you could see the events uh, or the drama of the butterflies' live, lives from far away. We think that's really important that the public understands that this building is designed to keep them alive and thriving. We worked at the scale of their feeders. So looking at how their proboscis uh, works to get nectar or, or drink from fruits, uh, areas for egg laying and then resting points or perch points. These are actually some of the feeders we designed for the American Museum of Natural History. We worked at full scale here at other uh, solutions for the butterflies and different aspects of their life cycle. This was for painted ladies, but these 3D prints were looking at where butterflies sleep and how they get access to different nectars. Uh, we then built it into a geometry uh, for different aspects of their life and turned it into concrete. Uh, there was reasons for that. Uh, one is that we needed a material that was gonna last 200 years, is structural and fireproof. So we worked with BASF, we made the greenest concrete imaginable, here we are making these casts, concrete casts, using a medical grade silicone. So there's no VOCs, no need for a mask. We're using plybu scaffolding, so we're as green as possible. And then fly ash impregnated concrete uh, with a special chemical mixture from BASF to be the lowest embodied energy concrete you can find. That's still structural. And then we made these casts to be placed inside this double skin facade of the building. So we're working at full scale with the butterfly's life cycle to place it inside a building, looking at all the different functional points of butterfly's needs and still not sacrificing one square foot of usable space for humans, which I think is essential. So this is the double skin facade, the diagrid structure on the outside and all the nectar feeding points for the butterflies uh, over there. Whoops, sorry, we went haywire for a second. So this is the actual facade with bioplastic lashes to direct the butterflies. This was a four ton uh, piece of equipment that's at full scale. That is meant to be the facade working to show this vertical mosaic for butterflies to thrive in. It's also porous so they can rewild the city around them. They're not stuck inside there. It's not a chamber for making butterflies. It's, an, it's a refuge for butterflies to get a chance at life. So all those concrete components uh, fit into the building. There's 50% aperture points so you can look out the window and see that butterfly garden. There are the monarchs in the space actually thriving. They have mud bath areas, perch points, areas to rest, and just the right amount of space. It's about one meter in length uh, in the building. Uh, to move around and create this buffer zone between human programmatic needs and the needs of the butterflies uh, themselves. So these are actual live monarchs. Here, this was installed at the Smithsonian in uh, the Cooper Hewitt in New York City. And uh, it's since moved on to a number of other areas. Anyway, that's just some of the work we've been up to at Terraform One. Thanks for listening, guys. Uh, I really appreciate that. 
uh, feel free to come and, and meet us here in the Brooklyn Navy Yards. We would like to see everybody that we can in person. So you're certainly welcome. And, and I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and I'd be, I'm more than happy to answer some questions. I'm sure you've got some. Thanks very much. Excellent, thank you. Thank you so much. That was um, fantastic. And uh, yeah, guys go ask questions. They look stunned. Omar, please go. Uh, yeah, I want to ask a question, please. Uh, all of these projects and research, can we, uh, can, can you, yeah, your, your lab, your huge lab, can make these projects uh, in space like uh, Mars to make uh, a life for these insects or, or, these, uh, or the car or the, to make a life in uh, the space? Yeah, so Omar, if you want to join our team with NASA and the Canadian Space Agency, we are putting, we're putting insects in space. Uh, we're a part of, you can look it up online, but there is a challenge to figure out long-term space missions and getting diversity in protein and food sources and make it self-reliant on a pretty much a completely contained hermetically sealed world which is uh, you know, more or less a spaceship and then eventually a colony. So we are looking at providing uh, a farming system and then a clever way of printing food uh, for astronauts. We call the project Astro Nosh, which is a little bit of a joke, but Astro Noshing is a thought and, and it's only architects can think of printing food and growing it from you know, insects. So we, we've got a pretty good team. We're working with the Rhode Island School of Design and Peter Eden. And uh, we're going into our next phase in June to work on this system and see if bugs in space are going to work. It's not going to work if astronauts don't like eating them. So we've got to make sure that it's hedonistic. It's got to taste phenomenal. And it's got to look good. And you don't want to think you're eating bugs either. But if I told you what's in a gummy bear, it's disgusting. But you'd still eat a gummy bear. And don't forget lobsters. They look, they're the craziest, scariest thing you can imagine. Uh, they were only fed to prisoners in Maine, in the United States. Now lobsters are a delicacy. So it's only a matter of time before we might be eating a flower, not an actual insect, but a flower. And we certainly can do that in space and do that uh, more so than bringing cows to space or pigs, space pigs. Uh, it doesn't make sense. So, so we can get all kinds of leafy greens with astronauts going, but Astro Nosh is to look at uh, protein sourced from insects. So great yeah. question. You're welcome to join uh, one, that team. It's yeah, I stuff. hope so. Yeah. Anyone else want to comment, points of anger, disbelief? Don't, don't be reticent. I see some yeah. hands up. Maram, you're, you're muted. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. But I want to ask about the project of Cricket, cricket Shelter uh, Forum. Um, because you mentioned something about the food itself, like it could be a case of social acceptance for people to eat crickets as the main source of protein. So in this case, what can be done in order to maybe um, make people understand the, the benefits behind eating a crickets as the main protein uh, source, not eating cows? And also maybe the other issue could be regarding the production efficiency for the stakeholders themselves or the uh, factories maybe uh, owners because they think maybe if you want to produce a piece of meat in uh, a lab maybe it takes like two hours but on the other side if you want to produce like one kg of a lamb it could take like one minute or two minutes so it's also cost it's, it's a matter of cost and efficiency at the same time so how can we downside downsize the, the gap between the production efficiency and also 
Mm. At the end, achieve the, the biodiversity uh, maintenance and sustainability. Yeah, great question. Questions plural. Uh, okay. Let me uh, let me let me let me address them. Uh, well, first of all, yeah, um, doing things at scale is uh, you know it, it's a lot different when you're uh, experimenting, doing bench work. Uh, you know, going from experimentation to then eventually bulk operations, that's, those are big leaps and you have to look at productizing the system. A lot of that has to do with finding out what the market is, what the, the, uh, the, the scale of potential economic gain is in that market and, and looking at a return on your investments when you make a factory to produce insects at such a scale. Uh, there are already like I said before, like 80% of the world is eating bugs. Uh, and you could go to places like Thailand and go to cricket farms and they're enormous. Uh, and it is super cheap, unbelievably cheap. And I think they're, you know, in general, you, Europeans and Americans should be more, uh, what's the term, flexitarians. We should be more flexible in the things that we eat. Eat, still eat meat, still eat some cows, but eat less of them and try other things uh, that are exciting to eat. So uh, the only way they're going to try eating it is if it tastes amazing. So that's important. A lot of the work we were doing was to get the taste great. So it's not just about scaling up the industrial side of the operation. It's about convincing people that there's a market for it because it tastes great. They're willing to pay a certain price point, And that when you build these kinds of facilities in Europe or the United States, you'll get your money back within a five to 10 year plan. The, the, when they grow crickets in a place in Thailand or various parts of Indochina, like it is disgusting. They just have massive cinder block and concrete farms where they have all the bugs together in a room and they mash them up with bits of dirt, feces, baby crickets, young, old, everything just gets mashed up and turned into a food product. They don't have the same kind of sanitary or hygienic requirements for the Food and Drug Administration that we'd have here in the United States. And they're not really concerned about that. If you even go to Mexico, they just serve crickets straight up, a little bit of salt and lime, totally normal. And they're extremely cheap. Uh, so it's, it, it actually, the potential is enormous. It's really the psychological factor that one needs to get over. And the only way to get over that is by by producing things that are hedonistic, that are exciting, that are beautiful, that are culturally based and taste great. In the United States, we didn't eat raw fish. No one ate raw fish in the 70s. That just didn't happen. In fact, same with Europe. Sushi came along towards the end of the, I mean, sushi has been around for centuries, but it, it was arrived because of amazing chefs, amazing sort of uh, I, I would say propaganda around it, but marketing, the marketing around eating sushi was enormous. It was about health and hygiene and great taste and sophisticated dining experience. Before you know it, you know, you had everyone eating sushi. Uh, and crazy as it sounds, uh, it's true. So uh, the same thing with insect-based powders. I think you'll eventually see it come to life when we get behind it culturally and build in the right restaurants, the right chefs, the right attitude and send signals that it's, it's about your well-being, It's about being healthy, eating this as a food product. Then it's very easy to scale up the industry side, but you wanna scale it up in an in a environment that is extremely clean and hygienic, different than developing nations and how they produce crickets. So great, great questions. Uh, it's just, a, I think it's a matter of time on, on educating people on the potentials of, of how good this tastes. You're on mute. Next question. There's, yeah. Matunde? Matunde or me. Right, go first. Uh, yeah. uh, thanks uh, for your presentation. Uh, uh, I would like to ask, uh, What's the, the structural stability of the shear uh, grown with mycelium, uh, which we showed in the presentation? And uh, what uh, is the adverse uh, effect of solar radiation on it if uh, exposed uh, to, to sunlight for a long time, let's say 
uh, it's used outdoor for your recreational purpose. I heard the first part about mycelium, and the second thing you were saying about the leaves. What? What? what uh, the, the, the second part is I'm asking uh, what could be the adverse effect of solar irrigation uh, on this uh, design of the shear that is grown with mycelium if if uh, if exposed uh, to sunlight for a long time. Ah, uh, okay, great question. Um, well, number one, it's not meant to be outdoors. So we're not designing them for outdoors, they're all interior use. We've had the chairs in, in here, uh, we micromanufactured them. We got three of the, these chairs right outside. They've lasted for seven years, no problem. If we expose them to the elements, you're right. So the sunlight will break it down, rain will break it down, cold weather will break it down, and it will, it will eventually mulch, turn into mulch and return to the earth. That is the point. So we, these, this is interior furniture. No different than your sofa. I don't think you want to put your sofa outside. Uh, there are chairs designed for outside, but this isn't designed for that purpose. The structural, uh, that's another good question. The structural capacity for mycelium uh, is really limited. It's not great in tension at all. It just doesn't work in tension. It's, it's okay in compression, but it's not much stronger than different types of foams. So it's, it is a, it's a very lightweight insulating material. So it's good for uh, acoustical tiles. It's good for uh, any kind of insulation in a building. It's good for some sort of uh, curved surfaces around windows or brise on the inside, but it's not really, um, yeah, it's not, it's not a great structural material. When you combine it with bamboo, it fuses to that and becomes a lot stronger. And that's the only way you can really make something like these chairs is you need uh, a hardwood uh, you know, of some kind or even a softwood to fuse it together. Uh, there, there's different versions from Ecovative that are panelized. So they put mycelium on the inside in a series of layers of plywood. And that's a pretty good product. And I know there is a leather that just came out uh, I think it's for Gucci handbags. Uh, it's a mushroom leather. Uh, that's pretty fantastic. That's by Phil Ross. I want to say Gucci, but I, uh, I don't know. Maybe it's Louis Vuitton. Does it really matter anyway? Uh, but some super sexy thing. But again, it's, it's, it's resistant to shear, the leather product. Um, and it's made in a special way so it can absorb shearing loads. But... Honestly, the material isn't great for anything tension or shear. It's best use is compressive. Yeah. So, but that means you can do some serious research and find ways to increase that capacity by combining it with different uh, materials and making a composite, uh, a composite biopolymer that could could do something greater than what mycelium can't do alone. Yeah, it's, a, it's a big space to work in. It's a really good question. Okay. I, I think you're on mute. I'm not. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, yeah, my question was like uh, when when I saw this car where you that you saw it, like there in the very beginning, like what materials did you did you use like to make it so like is it like TPU or something so it would bounce off? I mean, I guess it should be like some of these kind of more softer polymers or something. It Otherwise, it's, it can be a hard show to, to do that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Uh, well, essentially, it's different types of rubbers and air bladders. So yeah, it's also it's, super light. Yeah, it doesn't about, like, uh, it barely, uh, the, the weight of the vehicle right, is yeah, negligible. Right. The person weighs more than the car. So all of the technologies right. in the wheel itself, which is also surrounded yeah. by you know, rubber and air, uh, it doesn't have to be one of these vulcanized radial steel wheels either. It's just a, the whole thing is basically a beach ball. And it's made to be lightweight, you know, usable for X amount of time. And then the fabric can be switched out. But we're looking at um, different foams that you can find in sneaker technology. Sneakers are insanely beautiful. They're lightweight. They've got different types of, of coloration and rubbers and surfaces and textures and just imagine if the entire body of a car 
was made from the similar kind of materialization that you find in, in sneaker tech. And then it's scuffable, you can clean it. It works for you know five or six years and then it could be repaired and fixed. And you can think of a whole industry of people working, designing car bodies and getting very sexy with air-based or lightweight car bodies. Yeah, don't, kind, of, yeah. kind of like XPS. Like I have made modes out of XPS for concrete spraying and it's like that, like this kind of foamy material and stuff like there is also like the uh, the same material is this hips for 3D printing. Like uh, it's the same polyurethane, uh, yeah, polystyrene actually. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Also, it's, great it's, ideas. The idea uh, we make cars only uh, out of sheet metal is absurd. So we, yeah. that's it. Since Henry Ford, that's all we think about cars. Doesn't matter where you are, like uh, whether you're uh, China, India, you know, Middle East, uh, South America. Like, all vehicles seem to be made of shiny precious metal this is absurd like we can actually if we're going to design them to go slower and denser inside cities we can be more lightweight in the envelope uh that surrounds them and there, there's been some vehicles that have been made in the 70s out of fiberglass and and uh you know different types of lightweight plastics we just want to return to that and then think about using things that have no petrochemicals whatsoever yeah, and, and you can replace it like if it's recyclable yeah. because most of these polymers are recyclable. All yeah, the polyethylene, polypropylene, all of that stuff, like it's recyclable and plus you can make POA on your own. I mean, you need just cornstarch or whatever. Uh, yeah. And uh, you, you can just like replace your bumper or whatever you're. So, so you're totally right. In, uh, in the 1930s, Henry Ford, grew a car. He grew it out of soy based uh, plastics, and he wanted to emerge the American agricultural economy with the American automobile economy. And he grew a, a Model T Ford uh, out of soy based plastic. And he actually showed the plastic was so hard, he hit it with an axe, and it didn't even leave a scratch. And you can check that out on the internet. It's insane. He had this strong desire to use all different types of polymers that you can grow and replace infinitely with cars but americans didn't want that yeah. americans yeah we wanted giant metal boxes yeah. and we still want giant metal boxes so look at the latest tesla truck yeah, yeah like yeah. the cyber truck is yeah yeah you know, it's the wrong direction on some levels yeah oh, wow. but it's very cool i guess yeah it's really cool uh, because you can print your own parts for your car like just like if you have a 3D printer at home, like you can just yeah. like replace it. If you know the type, if you have the right polymer yeah. at home, you can just melt it and print it. Why not? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, let's have one more question by Dua, and then uh, I'm gonna have a question too. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Was a um, great question. I had a concern about the economic, uh, economical side. As mentioned in the lecture, Yanni, it's very costly to grow homes. So it could be very critical in order for this concept to, to spread and get to its goals. So is there currently or future plans for reducing the cost? I'm sorry, so you're, you're worried about the cost of growing homes? Is that the question? I'm worried about the cost and the relation to for the concept to spread as it's very critical for people to use it or yeah. Yes, use it yeah, yeah. Be very economically. Yes. Uh, well, uh, those are those are great questions. Uh, you know, we have been doing it for some time, and I think the the small answer is uh, your generation needs to work on different kinds of architecture. It looks like you're in the exact right program. Hello, biology, uh, and, and uh, you know you're in the right spot. Uh, it, you know, there's a ton more work that needs to happen in this field. The field is brand new. It's a nascent field and the things aren't comparable to the ways you construct with different types of concretes and steels. So the scale of economy isn't quite there yet. And the word isn't out. And it's just only within certain circles of architecture and parts of, you know, small parts of other fields do you even think that this is a feasible concept. Uh, that doesn't mean we should stop thinking about it. Uh, I know in the, in TU, is it Munich? Uh, Fernand Ludwig is doing a version of this, and he's great. 
uh, and there it's just now opening up to more and more minds to getting involved. So this is the time where your generation can be a part of actually contributing to it and, and realizing more and more of these structures. When I was a student, 3D printing was barely possible. Now we're 3D printing houses everywhere. It's not even interesting. There's nothing interesting in 3D printing a house. It's all, it's done. So this, the new biological or bioengineered architecture or engineered living materials, that is pretty new. So there's an opportunity there for you to take the torch and improve, optimize, perfect all these kinds of systems and certainly argue them. Like question authority, by the way. Uh, it's okay to kill your fathers and mothers. You know, that's kind of the goal is you want to actually create change. And this represents doing just that. I mean, I grew up, I was trained by people uh, that were interested in deconstruction. Zaha Hadid, Frank Gehry, uh, you know, Tom Main. Like this was what I was taught in school. And frankly, they're great. Frank Gehry is a hero. Zaha is a hero. But the work that we're doing has no relationship to what they've been doing, really. Uh, I think you have to move on and find your own path in your own direction. So I don't know how to, to get people uh, involved on it besides showing that it works and working hard through years of research to make something like this actually operate uh, at the building scale. But it doesn't mean that overnight the rest of the planet's going to grow homes. I, I certainly understand that. Uh, but eventually, uh, we'll get there. We'll get to this bioengineered age where we can do this uh, at scale and at cost, and it becomes more and more accessible. Thank you very much. That was almost like a sort of, you know, a last word for all the, uh, all the students here. Um, now, I would like to also comment on that because um, if you look at the cost of a uh, concrete building, with embedded energy, with a uh, insulation of 25 centimeter um, styrofoam. Uh, when you look at how these buildings are being built by people who kind of earn not very much by, by constructing them. Uh, so these guys could actually go out at their garden and uh, grow daisies and nettles and woodruff and dandelion, which you can all eat, which apparently I'm eating here in my garden so i sprinkled daisies you know on my porridge in the morning which is fantastic and then i mixed it with curcuma and it's all free um I so that. i think it's, it's <laughs> wonderful uh, sometimes it gives you a little bit of a, a, a thing in your in your tummy but you need to get used to that but that's that's all good and this is all very very sustainable and and i think there needs to be like a complete change in in mindset um, the, the biggest problem we have, and this is also what the students in, in the design studio um, are currently working on, is we have that brownfield site, which is owned by, of course, a company, and that company now negotiates with um, the, the mayor and the authorities of what to build, how to build. Uh, and apparently they are discussing uh, the same stuff that they have been discussing uh, 25 years ago. So the idea of bringing um, a professor of ecology in there or uh, material sciences is not there yet and uh, my, my question in a way so the comment for the students of course is work on authorities but my question for for uh for mitchell is um how do you do this i mean how do you how do you approach authorities or have you had to approach authorities um with the work that you're doing at the moment because these facades that you're creating like for instance the the curtain wall for the butterflies uh that's completely against everything we learn in regulations um so mm -hmm. how, how do you do this because i think this is the biggest battle against uh, windmills right it's oh, not so okay. much the clients i think it's more it's more the policies the authorities and the styrofoam lobby you know i mean this is a big thing yeah um everything you said is right so um how do we do these things that's uh, that's uh that is the the one of the ultimate questions uh well we don't do it quickly so that's probably the first answer and you know we have been working on these problems for a long time and we also produce a lot of mishaps and failures mm -hmm. 
So I don't really show that. I don't show the, the kind of the work that didn't happen, the work that wasn't successful, the work that just got stuck on a shelf. Uh, because a lot of the work that we do, uh, that, would, that also happens. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's a process and it does take um, some time. But uh, we have found something like the Butterfly Project. Uh, I think we found a reason or rationale for developers and for city planners and for those in charge of regulations to allow it to go through uh, for some other reasons uh, that we didn't plan on. Uh, in part, um, it actually has to do with uh, another part of the market is that uh, we're saturated with Starbucks, with targets, with you know ridiculous uh, cookie cutter ideas in development to put at the anchor points of a building, you know, the, and none of that sells anymore. Uh, so people are looking for real differences in amenities and amenities and marketing is actually the way in we found to a lot of these projects. Uh, the marketers, uh, even BASF has a massive marketing campaign, world's largest chemical company there in Germany. Uh, they wanna save monarch butterflies, had no idea that they were interested in that and they're spending, I don't know, tens of millions of dollars to promote saving monarch butterflies. We happened to have a project that was working on a similar thing. Uh, just we had totally different reasons for it, but they're doing it to, I would say, a little bit of greenwashing, honestly. Like, you know, they're, they've, <laughs> they're producing a lot of carbon. Yeah. And, but that's a win win, really. Yeah. It's a win win. So. Yeah. So, they, so the marketing people, uh, uh, we're heavily interested in helping promote a project like this because it makes them look good. It's act an actual amenity for the building. So the people, the occupants of the building actually enjoy it and they can go someplace else for a Starbucks or for other things that you would normally put in a building to help sell it or help make it unique. So, uh, you know, no one's ever really rejected nature in a city. It's just that we've been heavily interested in manicuring it. And that's probably the problem. Like it, we're still, even this French guy, uh, uh, what's his name, Patrick Blanc with the, the green walls. It's just, a, you know, it's a garden and it's good. He's good. Like, honestly, he's good. Even his blue hair, he's good. And he's French. So he's good in French, which is not always the case, but he's making it work really well. But it's, it's not enough, frankly. And it's very, uh, you know, Louis the 14th. It's total control a uh, regimented control of plants for miles. And that's, a, that's not the right attitude. You want biodiversity. You want yeah. things to flourish. You want unexpected results. You want moss, lichens, weeds. You want all kinds of things to just thrive. And if we can let go a little bit uh, and feel a little more free uh, and plan to have things be unplanned, I think we can allow for more of this kind of biodiversity uh, mm. elements to exist. So mm, that's, um, that's great. Yeah, I mean, in, yeah. in Berlin, we have uh, apparently more biodiversity than anywhere else in the country, uh, which has to do with um, uh, the, 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 the Cold War uh, and yep. the death strip actually between East and West Germany and yep. uh, a lot with the trains that came over from East Europe and Russia in the Second World War. Uh, so in, in these sort of strips, we have an enormous amount of, uh, of, of biodiversity, which at the moment is at stake, uh, especially at mm -hmm. uh, the site also where the students are working on, because there's one of these train line uh, mm -hmm. brownfield sites next to next to the train tracks. Um, so there's there's a lot um, uh, a lot to do, and um, I hope that uh, the, the students also uh could see and appreciate the enormous uh design talent that is uh, in the work so it's not all like you know wooden pallets or uh boxes <laughs> you have to design that stuff yeah. um and it's not done by pressing a button in in grasshopper it's actually done by also drafting it drawing it thinking it and and the tectonics i mean these beautiful details right sort of where you have the pipes going through some sort of um a hole with like a washer and a rubber seal and so on all these things are bespoke designed 
uh, I just want to make everybody aware of how much fun this is, right? If you just take a drill and, and, and a few bits and pieces that you find in the builder's merchant, I mean, take $50, go to the builder's merchant, grab some stuff and build something. Yeah. Um, and I think this is how you get, how you get there. Uh, and, and that's extremely important because what I realize now with the remote teaching and remote learning, uh, we cannot access our workshops anymore. And uh, we start becoming uh, diagram architects and, and not building architects or, or making architects. And um, I think you need to take care of, of combining all these things, right? Because otherwise it's a one-liner uh, and it doesn't go very, doesn't go very far. So um, thanks, Mitch, for, for your talk and thank you for your invitation. As soon as we can, I'm going to pop over and um, I'm going to yeah. see your lab. Yeah. That's going to be super exciting. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's an easy ride, you know, to pop over to, uh, to New York and I haven't been for a while, of course. I am very serious. I would love to have you, love to have all of you guys come, come by. We will get the grand tour. Talk about a brownfield site. The Brooklyn Navy Yard is certainly one of them. And uh, I hope to see you guys in Berlin. I love Berlin. I was just there yeah. for a few months. NYU, where I'm teaching, we have NYU Berlin, which is uh, pretty big. So we have the John Hadek buildings and I go as much as I can. And you're right, Berlin has a lot of potential with green spaces and yeah. it can keep biodiversity going and the airport and yeah, so yeah. much. Yeah, Let, let's absolutely. see. I mean, I don't know if there's any sort of at the moment, any sort of American, German, uh, kind of uh, collaboration things again uh, with Biden. There might be more uh, than we had in the past. So uh, uh, fingers crossed on that one. Uh, and um, yeah, thank you very much, everybody. I would like to um, close the session for today. Uh, have a great day, Mitch. Uh, have a great thank day you. or a great evening wherever you are um in in the crowd here and uh i see the design students tomorrow morning for the PIF, and then in the afternoon and i'm going to see the artificial nature students uh next week see you thank guys. you very much Take bye, -bye. Care. my pleasure Take bye care. guys